Okay, so, so I'm Sean Akashru. Uh, I'm a professor of physics at Stanford. And I have to confess that there will be uh, very little music or art in my presentation, <laughs> except that I find the objects I'll talk about somewhat beautiful. Uh, most of the art that you'll see was stolen from Google Images. So. <laughs> it's very 21st century. So I'm going to talk about the possibility, I don't know, in science or science fiction, that there are extra dimensions in our universe. Now, um, most people, when I tell them I'm a theoretical physicist, they kind of um, groan and then tell me how much they hated taking math and physics in high school. Um, but one of the few bits of fundamental physics that really we all learn immediately when we're children, uh, it's the first, you know, the first real deep realization we have, is that our playing field uh, consists of three spatial dimensions in time. We can go up or forward or right, uh, and that's pretty much it. Uh, and of course, uh, time evolves. Now, what's interesting is that this first thing that we learn is actually no longer belief by, I would say, probably the majority of theoretical physicists who come out of at least high energy physics and gravity. Um, our more mundane cousins in condensed matter physics probably can still believe this. <laughs> now, there are a few reasons for this. None of them are yet experimental, and so what I'm saying might be science fiction, uh, but we're quite confident that our, that our reasoning is, is leading us down a correct path. So we have today uh, a representation of the periodic table of fundamental particles. A century ago, this would have been Mendeleev's periodic table that we saw in the previous talk, and you'll see it here too. Uh, but today, after spending billions and billions of your tax dollars, <laughs> we found out that the nuclei of the elements that appeared in the previous talk are actually splinterable. The, the protons and neutrons are made of quarks. Here they are. Up and down are the ones that play a role in real life. Uh, we ourselves are made largely of up and down quarks and electrons, but for each of the quarks and electrons that compose our, our cells, they're also fatter analogs. So in addition to the electron, there's a muon and a tauon. The muon and the tauon are just like the electron. They have the same charge, but they weigh more. And so they can decay into the electron, and the only place you ever find them are in physicists' labs. Okay, and similarly, there are heavier quarks that we pay a lot to discover. And the way these things bind to each other to make nuclei or to make atoms is through exchange of other elementary particles that carry forces. So the photon is the familiar, you know, it's the particle of light. There are photons impinging on your eyes when you see images. But there are also strongly interacting gluons that bind nuclei. And there are two particles that mediate uh, nuclear decay, beta decay. Now, one of the clear things about this, I call it a periodic table, because this is too complicated to be fundamental. Okay, there are one or two particles, maybe you, you're onto something. This, this shows replication of structure, there are many things here. It reminds you of the periodic table, and it means we should try to unify these things. It means that somehow we're missing the story. Okay, here's the similar table in chemistry. We saw it in the last talk. And you know that the final story with this table in chemistry, as beautiful and elementary as this is in, in our world, is that these things are all complicated composites. The nuclei are made of protons and neutrons. There are electrons orbiting the nuclei. And all of these objects are somehow very complicated, derived objects. And they're not, in that sense, basic. Uh, though they're basic in most aspects in our world. So this complicated periodic table, if you were uh, smart enough and had a big enough computer, you could, in principle, derive just by knowing quantum mechanics and that there are electrons, protons, and neutrons. Now, in practice, to actually solve the equations of quantum mechanics for, a new, you know, for an atom that has 100 electrons is actually impossible. And so we have great faith that we understand these things, not because we've done that, but because for the simplest few elements, hydrogen and helium and a few others, we really understand how to solve the equations. And for the rest, we have confidence that small, small pieces of our bag of tricks work to explain phenomena that they participate in, and so there shouldn't be anything fundamentally different. But we can't solve the 100 electron Schrodinger equation. Now, so I told you we've succeeded once before with the periodic table in getting to a more elementary description. And we have this periodic table. And so you might wonder whether it's just the same story repeated. These things will be made of smaller particles orbiting other smaller particles ad infinitum. And there's at least one good reason to think that something more interesting will happen in the case of the current periodic table of elementary particles. See, in the case of chemical elements, the explanation was just compositeness. You have hundreds of objects because you can take a few electrons, protons, and neutrons and put them together in many, many ways, many hundreds of ways that are you know, long-lived. But with the current table of elementary particles, there's an important missing ingredient. It's not listed on these tables that they sell at Fermilab uh, because it's, it's a, a force carrier that's negligible in most experiments. It's the force carrier of gravity. 
the graviton. Okay, gravity is very important at long distances. It holds us to the Earth. It holds galaxies together. But at short distances, it's completely irrelevant. Uh, you know, the following experiment shows this. The entire Earth is pulling against this glass of water. I will use electromagnetic forces to raise the glass of water. Okay, so just one puny human can defy the entire force of gravity generated by the Earth. <laughs> so the graviton doesn't appear on this list. But it should be. <laughs> Now, the interesting thing about the graviton, and, and really the reason that physicists still revere Einstein so much, is that he understood it's actually fundamentally different from those other particles. In that the graviton, uh, far from being a participant that moves around in, in a, a fixed background space-time or universe, is actually deeply tied to the geometry of space-time itself. So the reason Einstein is revered is that he explained that the real way to think about uh, Newton's laws or, or Newton's forces of gravity uh, is in terms of curved space-time. So in the correct theory of gravity, if you have matter, what it's really doing by having energy is telling space how to curve. And then the matter actually just moves along the straightest paths it can find in this resulting curved spacetime. So gravity is really fundamentally different from something like electromagnetism, where the photon moves around in space. Gravity actually is constructing the space itself. And the graviton is the small fluctuation of this curved spacetime. <laughs> What that means is that any theory unifying the graviton with other types of force carriers, something that would underlie our periodic table of elementary particles, has to ipso facto be actually a modified theory of space-time geometry. It has to tell us that the geometry of space works differently than we currently understand. And so it will be something deeper than saying that they're all made of little things. Now, there are old ideas along these lines modifying space-time geometry to unify forces. In fact, the oldest idea goes back to about 1920. Now, these guys had a much easier task than us because they hadn't yet spent billions of dollars, and so they only knew about two forces. They knew about gravity and electromagnetism. And so their job was to just unify these two into one single object. And uh, the, the gentleman pictured here, Theodore Caruso and Oscar Klein, actually were the first to realize that these different forces could actually be single as sorry, different aspects of a single force in a slightly different kind of geometry. In fact, in a geometry that had one higher dimension. Okay, so what was their idea? Uh, we all learned as kids that there's, you know, this forward and up and right. But their idea was that actually secretly, above each point in our space, in, in this three-dimensional Euclidean space that we approximately inhabit, there might be really an extra little circle. So space would actually be four-dimensional. And one of the dimensions would be so small, it would be compact, it's a circle. So if you go around, you come back to the same point. But if that circle was small enough, we actually wouldn't have noticed it yet. Okay, that might sound a little silly, but if you think about the way we see things, we see things with photons. As long as photons live in our space, but don't have the freedom to propagate on this circle, the only way we can detect it is indirectly by gravitational experiments. And I'll show you those bounds. But their idea is actually far from really ruled out in any practical sense. In fact, the current bounds on the size of such a dimension, as long as light doesn't move there, are about a hundredth of a million, which is pretty macroscopic. Now, if that were the picture, how would you get approximately three-dimensional physics that we all learned about when we were kids? Well, we're, we're living at roughly points on this circle. I mean, after all, it's so small, it, it's, it's imperceptible to our electromagnetic forces because the photon doesn't move there. Gravitationally, we can't detect such a small circle. So what we should do is average the physics over the circle and integrate it out and get effective four-dimensional physics, three plus one-dimensional physics. And so you could ask, what would a consequent four-dimensional world look like if you started really with one extra dimension, with five space-time dimensions? So in Einstein's theory, I'm afraid this is almost going to be an equation, but uh, I'll explain the equation. So in Einstein's theory, um, the dynamics of space is what the theory is about. It tells you how space curves and bends. And the graviton is the small fluctuation of this curving, bending space. Uh, and then the fundamental objects in the theory are things like distances between two points in space. You know, the force of gravity or the Coulomb interaction falls like some function of the distance between objects. So if you have some separation in coordinates, delta x, delta y, delta z, in three dimensions, the distance squared is given by something Einstein called a metric, gij, that multiplies these deviations uh, in the two points that you're trying to connect. So you subtract the x-coordinates, y-coordinates, and z-coordinates, you contract them with this metric, and you get a number. 
which is the difference. So the fundamental object in Einstein's theory is actually this matrix of numbers that tells you about the distance between two space-time points. In three dimensions, the spatial metric would be a three by three symmetric matrix. So now let's imagine an analog of Einstein gravity, but with an extra spatial dimension. So there would be a new coordinate displacement that separates two points. It would be the separation W on the circle, right? Because we have here, you can separate points in X, Y, and Z, which are supposed to be this plane, but it could also be that one point is at this point of the circle and one point is up here, and that adds to the distance. So you would end up instead with differences between points having just differences in the x, y, z, and w directions, with w being the new direction. And to contract those to find the distance using a metric, you would need a, a bigger metric. Since there are four of these and four of these, there should be four by four indices here, or 16. So the fundamental object in this theory would now be something that has four more components, if you look at a four by four symmetric tensor, four extra components relative to Einstein's gravity in three spatial dimensions. Now, what are those extra things? Well, the realization of Kaluza and Klein was that we could interpret those as four-dimensional physicists, as people who don't see the fifth dimension, in the following way. One of these would parameterize a piece of obvious data. That is, there are circles here, but the circles have some radius or some circumference, 2 pi r. We could choose the radius. That should somehow appear in our theory. It's a parameter of the theory. That's one of the extra numbers in our 4 by 4 metric. The other thing is kind of harder to, to motivate that way for people who don't like equations. But if you wrote out the metric, here's what we would have called the metric before. It's a 3 by 3 block in our new 4 by 4 tensor. And here's the radius. And then the other thing, there are three extra components there. They naturally form a vector in space. There's three of them. They're like an AX, an AY, and an AZ component of this object. And in fact, that's exactly the data you need to specify an electromagnetic field. The electromagnetic field is, is specified by, by talking about a vector potential from which you derive electric or magnetic fields. So the other three give precisely the right mathematical structure to automatically give rise to electromagnetism in the lower dimensions. You start in five dimensions with just gravity, but if the space-time has a circle in it, at distances large compared to the radius of the circle, you end up in four dimensions with gravity, one scalar that represents, represents the radius of the circle, and an electromagnetic field. So you unify electromagnetism with gravity by adding one dimension. Now in such a theory, the 4D Coulomb interaction between charged particles would not be exactly what you expect from normal electromagnetism for the following reason. You see, if you take a particle that's moving around on a circle, there are different things it can do. The most boring thing it can do is always stay at the same point on the circle. But it can also wind around the circle as you go through time. It could, it could run around the circle once or twice or three times or four times. It could have different momenta on the circle. And those different momentum modes, uh, or modes of different wavelength on the circle, actually give rise to different particles in four dimensions. The one with no momentum is the one I was talking about, the one that looks like electromagnetism. But it's cousins that have momentum on that circle. They'll have very high energy because they're moving on a very small space. But um, they would show up at experiments. An exchange of these extra cousins of the photon, the ones with momentum in this hidden small dimension, would modify the Coulomb force. So in fact, people do experiments. Experiments are done to take very well shielded matter where you think you know the forces of play very well, and try to see whether the forces between the, the plates, whether they be charged or gravitationally attracting each other, are precisely Coulomb-like, or whether there are small corrections that could be due to these extra particles generating corrections to the 1 over r potential. So some of these experiments are done by people at Stanford, some at Colorado and Washington. I think the upshot is if you want a force about one times as strong as gravity, some modification of gravity of order 1 at scales of order micrometers, that is 10 to the minus 6 meters, then, then you run across these bounds. So you know, at forces of reasonable strength, we can rule out this idea for dimensions that are about a hundredth of a millimeter, which is actually shockingly coarse. Now, all these ideas I've told you are actually reasonably old, after all. Just look at this picture. Nobody would appear in a picture like this today. 
Uh, but there are modern incarnations of this uh, that are very alive and well. Okay, so since the time of Clues and Klein, we, we've learned a lot about fundamental interactions. So instead of just two things, electromagnetism and gravity, we need to deal with explaining why there are triplicates here. We need to deal with explaining why there are these 12 carriers of forces uh, by some reasonable way of counting. So our task has gotten a lot harder. And, you know, our grandfather circle just isn't going to do it anymore. So we need to update the idea. Now, our most promising way, actually, for other reasons of modifying Einstein's theory, uh, in order to make it compatible with quantum mechanics, replaces elementary particles uh, not with smaller elementary particles of which they're composed, but with something called superstrings. Okay, so for, I, for reasons that would take certainly more than the 20 minutes I have here, uh, people think that it could be that the substructure underlying the electron and the quarks isn't just ever smaller particles, but really uh, tiny, tiny loops of string whose different uh, oscillator modes could give different particles in four dimensions. Now, I can't explain why, why superstring theory is, is thought to be consistent with both quantum mechanics and relativity. Um, but I can say that mathematical consistency of these theories requires the existence of extra space-time dimensions. And in the simplest versions, in fact, you get not one, but six new spatial dimensions. And that really comes out as a, as a, as a mathematically clean statement. It's not something we put in. Now, the result, then, is a very rich generalization of Kuzan and Klein's picture, where one is forced to postulate that above each point in our space, there's not a circle, but there should be something that solves the analog of Einstein gravity in 10 dimensions uh, and reduces it to our approximate Euclidean space times time, and then some six-dimensional object. And the, the, the solutions of these Einstein equations in 10 dimensions um, actually exist because of some remarkable work of mathematicians, Kalabi, who conjectured that six-dimensional spaces with the right mathematical properties exist, and Yao who proved Kalabi's conjecture. Uh, Yao proved Kalabi's conjecture in 1979, before string theory had, had, was, was the glimmer in anyone's eye except John Schwartz's. So the mathematicians were interested in these objects for other reasons, and as I said, these objects are actually quite beautiful. Uh, so here, they're, they're six-dimensional, so it's hard to visualize them. But what you can do is take an equation defining such a six-dimensional object and then project it and project it and project it, and these are pictures of the project projections of these objects. And what you see is that they have a lot of interesting topology. Even in the projection, there are many holes, there's complicated interconnectedness. If you tried to weave a string through this, it could go through the holes and reconnect in many different ways. So there are actually artists whose, whose work consists of making interesting pictures of Kalabi Yama animals, um, but I don't know any of them. <laughs> <laughs> now, the, uh, the richer spectrum of extra dimensions and the richer spectrum of topologies gives string theorists the opportunity to explain that larger set of objects that we currently have to explain. With just a circle, you couldn't unify all 12 force carriers together. But maybe with six dimensions, you can. Okay, and roughly speaking, and again, I can't give more than a, a cartoon, the idea is if you have these topologically non-trivial cycles, and if you imagine getting states from wrapping strings around these things in, in contractible ways, that gives you a stable string, you can't contract it, well then, with many topologically non-trivial handles, there are many ways to wrap the strings. That gives rise to many different flavors of elementary particles in the lower dimensional world, where the circle would give just one. Okay, so for a scientist, this is a kind of odd talk to give. Um, you know, you don't know me and you don't know my degrees, so you might think I'm a quack who believes there are extra dimensions. Okay, but one thing is, is sure, uh, we don't know whether this geometrization of physics by extra dimensions is true in our world, um, but we do aim to find out. Theoretical physics is a serious endeavor only because it also ties to experimental physics. Okay, so here, um, the citizens of America have become cheap, but in Europe, they pay tens of billions of euros to build a large Hadron Collider. There it is. I think it doesn't really light up from the sky if you fly over Geneva this way. But um, there's the ring, something like 40 kilometers across. And what it's doing these days is colliding protons together at energies that have not been reached since, uh, you know, some fraction of a second after the Big Bang. What we hope to discover this way is the first step towards unifying the current periodic table that we see before us. But we're probably not going to get all the way to the most deep structure that underlies it. Here's another picture. Again, um, <coughs> NASA spends all its money putting humans in space, but the Europeans instead put satellites in space that measure interesting things for physicists. This is the Planck satellite. Uh, the Planck satellite will tell us about the detailed ripples in the microwave photons that come from the end of the Big Bang. 
And the patterns in those microwave photons tell us about physics of unimaginably high energies that imprint, imprinted density and temperature fluctuations on the microwave radiation at the time of the Big Bang. So this will give us other hints about what was going on at unimaginably high energies in the very early universe. And again, the theories that involve this geometrization of extra dimensions have some kinds of implications for these experiments, though so they're much more distant than one would hope. Okay, frankly, these will give us hints, they'll give us little steps on the way to understanding whether this picture is true, but they're not going to get us all the way there by a long shot. So that's all I wanted to say. Uh, thanks for your attention. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs>